you please turn with me in your Bible to Romans chapter 3, to which we come this evening for that theme which we have arrived at in our series on doctrines of the Christian gospel. We began three weeks ago with the theme of the new birth or regeneration, then thought together about the theme of biblical repentance, and last Sunday evening about the biblical meaning of faith. And this evening, we turn to that doctrine which Martin Luther described as the truth of the Christian gospel, the principal article of the Christian faith, the doctrine of justification, or more fully, justification by faith. Now, I have no doubt whatsoever that Martin Luther was absolutely right and that this doctrine is, as he put it, the doctrine by which the church of Jesus Christ stands or falls. That is, if the church of Christ has grasped and is faithfully proclaiming this doctrine, it is a standing church. If it has failed to grasp and failed to proclaim the centrality and fullness of this doctrine, it is what he calls a falling church, because there is no question that it is the core of the gospel. It is also one of the greatest necessities of Christian men and women that they should have clarity about this gospel truth above all others. But although all that is true, it is also true that in the 1980s the term justification is one that we scarcely fully understand in connection with the Christian gospel. And I think it would be important for us to spend a little time trying to clarify the meaning of this great biblical and reformation word. It really means to declare or to constitute someone righteous before God. The word itself really comes from the biblical word for righteousness or righteous. And in order fully to understand it, I think we need to see its context in the epistle to the Romans, which really deals with the single theme of righteousness. It's possible to go right through the epistle to the Romans and see it as an exposition of the word righteousness. Righteousness is what God Himself possesses and displays in His character. He is above all other things the righteous God who has become the righteous judge of all men. It is secondly what God not only displays in His character, but demands of His creatures. God's demand of men is nothing less than the very righteousness which He Himself displays. And that leads Paul into man's great dilemma, because what God possesses and demands is precisely what man by nature left to himself does not possess. And he rings out this truth in several different ways. There is none righteous, no, not one. It is the ultimate plight of man in the presence of God. There is no one righteous. And that is God's verdict upon man. Now, if righteousness is something that God possesses and displays, and God demands of His creatures, and man by nature lacks the fourth great truth of the epistle to the Romans, is righteousness is what God provides and offers and gives in Jesus Christ through the gospel. Now, that is what makes the gospel, you see, good news. The gospel is good news because... It provides for men that very righteousness which they do not possess and cannot achieve through the works of the law. So Martin Luther tells us 
that at one stage in his life he says, this phrase, the righteousness of God, I hated it. Because the righteousness of God was something I did not have, and a righteous God demanded it of me. And so I came to hate God's righteousness as my enemy, until I discovered that in His infinite mercy, righteousness was not merely a standard God required. It was a gift God offered in the gospel. And I received it by faith and became, in the eyes of an eternally righteous God, His righteous Son. Now that is why Martin Luther went out into the world of the 16th century, proclaiming as the greatest news that could ever have dawned on his soul the doctrine of justification by faith alone. You may know that the word itself is a legal word. It comes from a legal background and immediately conjures up for us a picture of a law court with a judge dispensing justice, a prosecution giving evidence and seeking a verdict, a defense counsel seeking to refute that verdict and evidence, and above all, the accused person waiting for the verdict to be pronounced. Now, this is exactly the scene that you find in Romans from chapter 1, verse 18, right through to chapter 3, verse 20, where we read this evening. Paul pictures the whole of humanity gathered together before the judgment seat of God. And that's not an unrealistic picture because that is the surest thing about every single one of us here this evening. The one thing that the New Testament makes abundantly plain is that we shall all appear at the judgment seat of Christ. And that judgment seat is where God is here pictured in the epistle to the Romans, gathering the whole world before him. You may remember that he deals with every section of the world. In chapter 1 of Romans, the decadent pagan world. In chapter 2, the upright pagan world. In chapter 3, the religious world of the Jew. And he gathers all mankind before God's judgment seat. The prosecutor is the law of God. And as the law of God is read, as it were, in the ears of sinful man, one by one all his excuses melt away, and he is found universally guilty before God. They have not obeyed the law, and that law exposes their unrighteousness. And so you come to the great conclusion in chapter 3, verse 10. There is no one righteous. And then the apostle hammers the last three nails into the coffin of man's esteem of himself. No, not one. Now the extraordinary thing is that when the defense is given the opportunity to speak, there is a deathly, ominous silence. And we read of that in verse 19 of Romans 3. We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced. And the authorized is the better translation, and the whole world declared guilty before God. The point is, you see, the evidence is irrefutable. The prosecution has had a watertight case, and every word that has been spoken has been so clearly and obviously true. And mankind stands before the throne of God with no word that can be spoken. The whole world 
guilty before God. Now it is at this point that is revealed from verse 21 of Romans 3, the provision, the amazing and overwhelmingly wonderful provision that a holy God has made for sinners. But now, he says, no righteousness has been found in man. God still demands it. But now, verse 21, a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And that righteousness is God's provision in the gospel for man as a condemned sinner. I think perhaps the best and clearest way to see the meaning of justification is to understand it as the opposite of condemnation. Both justification and condemnation are verdicts pronounced by a judge. But in Scripture, condemnation is the verdict pronounced on all men because all have sinned and there is none who is righteous. And justification is the pronouncement that God makes not merely to declare us not guilty, but to give us a standing in God's presence as though we were righteous with the very righteousness of God. Now that is what justification is. It is a verdict that God pronounces upon men. And that is why in Romans chapter 8, when this whole section of the epistle is done, Paul cries out in a cry of thankfulness. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation is a verdict that is no more pronounced against us. And the opposite of it is justification which gives us, as I say, not just an absence of guilt, although it is that, but a standing in the presence of God of those who are righteous with His righteousness. Dr. Packer says justification is the truly dramatic transition from the status of a condemned criminal awaiting a terrible sentence to that of an heir awaiting a fabulous inheritance. Now that is what justification means. It is God's verdict, not just a verdict pronounced for the time being, but a verdict which is irreversible. There is therefore now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that irreversible verdict is the verdict that we hear from the lips of God when we believe. And it will be the very same verdict that we shall hear on the day when we stand before His judgment seat. So the verdict of justification is the verdict of the last day brought into the present day. And it is God's offer of mercy to us in Jesus Christ. Now, with that general background, which you have patiently listened to, I think we may go on to look at the three things which are most important about justification in this passage in Romans chapter 3. He speaks about three things. First of all, about the source of justification. Then about the ground of it. And thirdly, about the means by which we receive it. The source, the ground, the means. Where does it come from? 
On what basis is it given to us? And by what means do we receive it? These are the three issues that Paul is taking up in this passage. And they are, of course, the vital issues for us. Let me just say to you as we turn to this first part of the theme, how vitally important it is for us that we should recognize how much we need to know this verdict that God pronounces upon us. It will, you see, be too late to wait until the day of judgment to hear it. We need to hear from God and know within our own souls now that there is no condemnation against us, that there is no charge that can succeed against us, that there is no finger that can point to us because we are clothed in the righteousness that God has provided. That's something, my dear friends, that you need to be sure of here and now, not waiting until there and then. And so we look together at the source of our justification. And what Paul is telling us is very simply that the source of justification is in God and His grace. Notice how he repeats this in verses 21, 22, and 24. But now a righteousness that is a justification from God apart from the law has been made known. Verse 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 24, we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What I mean is that the author and initiator of our justification is God and God alone. He plans it and procures it for us for no other reason than that He is a God of grace. Now that means that we need to emphasize as we seek to understand what justification means that the initiative in our salvation universally lies with God. It was His plan, His idea. It was He who procured it for us. It was He who set about the way of finding it for us. It was He who devised it and then delivered it to us. The source of justification is God and His grace. And we must never turn that truth around so that in any sense we become the source of our own justification. How then do I become acceptable before God? How do I hear that verdict pronounced from the judgment seat of God as I stand before Him as a guilty sinner? not because there is anything in me that can win it, but solely because of His grace and mercy which He has revealed to me in the gospel. Indeed, it is true to say, as Archbishop Trench says, that the only contribution that the sinner makes to his own salvation is the sin which makes it necessary. Now, that is a most humbling truth. That is something that takes us and casts us down before God, humbled to the place where we recognize that we are made beggars by the gospel. And an inflated sense of our own importance and of our own worth is impossible if we really believe this doctrine. Because the essence of it is that we are brought into the presence of God saying, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. It's the language of absolute dependence 
the source of our justification is in God and His grace. Now, the reason for that, of course, is that this justifying work of God is something that is done apart from the law. Do you notice how he repeats this? Verse 21, now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. That is, it is a righteousness which is not dependent on us seeking to keep the law of God or fulfilling its demands and thereby seeking to climb up to a place of acceptance with Him. The movement in salvation is never from us to God, but from God to us. So the source of our justification is God and His grace. And therefore the Christian's constant cry is, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. The second great emphasis that Paul lays in this passage is that the ground of our justification is Christ and His cross. The first question is, where does our justification come from? The second is, what is our justification based upon? On what basis does God pronounce us to be righteous? Granted that God justifies sinners as a gift by His grace, the question you see still needs to be asked, how can a righteous God pronounce guilty sinners who are by nature unrighteous to be righteous? It is indeed the ultimate problem in God's dealings with sinful men. How can God justify or pronounce guiltless the guilty? That's the great issue. Now, of course, there are many people who never see a problem here. They can say simply, there is no difficulty in that. God can simply say, as He has guilty men before Him, we will forget all about your sin. We will ignore it. We will pardon it. And that's all that matters. There is no need for us to do anything more about it. It doesn't matter and you can go away and there is no judgment. Now if you think of what would happen in a human law court if that took place, you will see immediately the problem. And this is the analogy, you see. Many people say to me, well now, some people have done things against me that have hurt me and harmed me, and I forgive them and declare them to be acceptable to me, and I don't ask them to make some kind of sacrificial offering for the sake of it. I just say, you are forgiven. Cannot God be as generous? The significant thing is, you see, that God is not acting as a private individual. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. He is the judge of all creation. And He sits in judgment as the righteous and holy judge upon us, not as a private individual like ourselves. And if you take the analogy of the law court, could you imagine what would happen if a judge had some heinous crime committed by somebody before him and the man is standing in the dock and the judge suddenly turns round and says to him, well now, we'll forget all about this. It doesn't matter. We'll just set you off back into your previous life and we'll forget about everything. But of course, every man who cared for justice and truth and righteousness in the nation would immediately cry out, but it does matter. 
What matters is that righteousness should be maintained and that justice should be upheld. He can't do that. You know how people cry out when sentences are too lenient. Because it is the integrity of the whole legal system which is at stake, as well as of the judge himself. And therefore, God's great dilemma is this. How can the judge of all the earth, who is righteous beyond our understanding, declare righteous and acceptable in his presence and acquit as not guilty those who are manifestly guilty of all the breaches of the law of which they have been accused? How can a righteous God possibly declare unrighteous man to be righteous in his sight? You find the dilemma spelled out for us in the Old Testament. God clearly says in Exodus 23, 7, I will not justify the wicked. And he instructs the judges in Israel that they must justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, Deuteronomy 25, 1. Yet in Romans chapter 4 and verse 5, Paul actually speaks of God as him who justifies the ungodly or the wicked. And again we say, on what grounds can God possibly do this? Well, here in Romans 3 at verse 24, we have the only ground on which a righteous God can declare sinners righteous without either condoning their sin or compromising his holiness. And that ground is the death of his only Son as our substitute and sin-bearer. Notice how Paul puts it. In verse 24, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. Do you see it is almost as though there was this hush and silence in the court of God's assize of judgment? And man is condemned and hopeless and there is no possibility of any verdict except the verdict of guilty. But suddenly what God does is he sets forth or presents Jesus Christ before them. And the verdict is pronounced not upon man as the sinner, but upon Jesus as the righteous one. And the verdict that I should have heard pronounced against me, guilty, vile, and helpless, is pronounced against the spotless Lamb of God. And He bears my guilt in His own body by His death. Now the word that Paul uses in verse 25, which the NIV translates as sacrifice of atonement, is really the word propitiation. What it implies is that everything that God has declared that sin is due and that the sinner is due because of his sin. All that is the penalty and punishment of sin that is poured out from God's judgment throne falls not upon me as the sinner, but upon Christ as my substitute. That's what propitiation means, a sacrifice of atonement. And that's what the cross means, my dear friend. It is that all the judgment of God in all its awesome horror falls upon the head of his spotless son and he bears it to its very last drop. 
He drinks it, if you like, in the figure of that cup that he saw in Gethsemane. He takes it from the Father's hand and he drinks it to its dregs, the very judgment of a holy God on sin, so that the verdict might be passed upon me. There is therefore now no condemnation. Why? Why is there no condemnation? Because Christ has taken my condemnation. Why is it that God has accepted me as righteous in his sight? It is that Jesus Christ has taken my unrighteousness, all the ugly horror of the load of my sin, and he has clasped it, as it were, to his bosom. And God has taken his righteousness, and he has clothed me with it as he clothed the prodigal son with a new robe. And he has raised me to the place where looking upon me, he sees me righteous with the righteousness of Jesus. Martin Luther has some beautiful things that he says about this. When someone was suffering the agonies of uncertainty and doubt, he wrote to them, Learn to know Christ and Him crucified. Learn to sing to Him and say, Lord Jesus, You are my righteousness, I am your sin. You took on You what was mine, you set on me what was yours. You became what you were not, that I might become what you were. That is what justification means. Elsewhere, Luther says what happened on that day on Calvary was that the eternal God looked upon his Son, and taking the unrighteousness of sinful men, he laid it upon the Lord Jesus Christ and said to him, Be thou in the place of sinners, be thou Adam that rebel, be thou Peter that denier, be thou Judas that betrayer, be thou that sinner. And Jesus, he says, bowed his head and said, Even so, Father. Now, my dear friends, if you can see yourself in that place where with all your sin, if there were no other in the universe but me, that all my sin was taken. And the Lord Jesus hears the voice of the Father, Be thou Eric Alexander, with all the weight of the ugliness of his sin. And Christ bore it. And then when God the Father turns and looks upon me, it is as one now clothed with a righteousness not my own. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my kingly dress. That's what justification means. Now let me... Look with you at what the Apostle finally says about the means by which it's offered to us. The source from which it comes is the grace of God alone. The basis on which it is offered is Christ's death alone. The means by which it is brought to us is faith alone. 
So Luther would have said, justification is by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone. And what he means by that latter and what Paul means by it is clearly set out for us in this passage in verse 22, for example, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Verse 25, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Verse 26, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies the man who has faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 28, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Now let me say one or two things about the place of faith and justification before we finish. We were learning about the nature of saving faith last Sunday evening from David Ellis. But let me say two things about the place of faith and justification. The first is this, that faith is not the ground of our justification. That is Christ and his cross. So it is wrong to speak of faith as what we contribute to our justification. I have heard it put this way. God contributes grace. I contribute faith. And the mixture produces justification, salvation. Now, that is never what the New Testament says. The New Testament tells us that the sole ground on which God justifies and acquits sinners is His pure grace in Jesus Christ and His death. There is no contribution that we make. Faith is therefore the empty hand that stretches out to receive the gift of God in the righteousness He offers to us in Jesus. It is in no sense the ground on which God justifies the ungodly. The essence of saving faith is that it contributes nothing to salvation, but receives everything. But the other thing that I want to say to you is that although faith is not my contribution, as it were, to my justification, it is equally important to say that God does not believe for you. It is you who exercise faith. That is, you stretch forth the beggar's empty hand and receive the riches of God's mercy in Jesus Christ. Verse 25 says, It is to be received, that is, this atonement, through faith in His blood. Let me quote from John Stott to you. Faith is the hand that receives Christ. It is empty. Faith is the empty mouth that is open to receive the bread of God. Faith is the opened heart that is soiled by sin, waiting to receive the riches of God's grace. Faith is nothing. Christ is everything. But nonetheless, God calls upon us to stretch out that empty hand in order that we might receive the righteousness that He offers to us 
in the gospel. So the source of our justification is God and his grace. The ground of it is Christ and his cross. And the means of it is faith alone without our works. Now there are two applications of that to which we give a moment before we finish. If you are not a Christian this evening, or not yet a Christian, may I ask you, have you considered the fact that one day you will without any doubt whatsoever appear before the judgment seat of God? that there is coming a day when God is going to wind up the affairs of this bankrupt world and hold his last assize, and every single one of us will be there on that day. Now, on what will you be resting to hear a favorable verdict from God as your judge? on the last day? Will you be resting even in some measure on what you have done or hope to do? Or will you be resting utterly on Christ and on what He has done so that the verdict of God which sounds in your soul today may be the verdict that sounds then. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The other question applies to those who are Christians. I wonder if you are really resting on this truth of justification more accurately, I think, by grace through faith. That is a justification that rests on what God has done, not on what I have done. Does that, for example, come out in the assurance that you have about heaven and about eternal life? So that when people ask you, are you a Christian you don't say to them, well, I hope so, or it's not for me to judge. How many people give that response? But you see, that betrays the fact that in some sense they are really trusting in something of their own. I hope I may be. I hope I may have done enough to please God. I hope that the verdict one day will be the right one if I try hard enough they have never rested on Jesus' blood and righteousness and that alone. Because that gives an absolute assurance to the weakest, poorest sinner. Does it come out in the way you deal with the devil? As the accuser who comes to you, for example, and when you have done something of which you are ashamed, he will come to you and say to you, now, how could somebody like you ever be acceptable to God again? How could it ever be that God could welcome somebody like you into his presence again and delight in you and have fellowship with you? The thing is impossible, he would say. Now, how do you deal with the devil when he comes as the accuser of the brethren like that? Do you say to him, well, now, just a minute, I'm not as bad as you're making out, and there are lots of other things that could be put on the other side of the slate to balance the picture a little bit. That's a distorted view of me, I would think. Well, I'll tell you what the justified sinner says to the devil. He says, you haven't pronounced the half of it. You haven't spoken one fraction of all the evil that there has been and still is in my own heart and mind. But I have no confidence in myself that is in my flesh to please God and be acceptable to Him. 
My hope and my salvation rests not on anything in me, but in the perfection of the righteousness of my Savior, which God has given me by His grace. And that's where I rest. And the devil will flee from you. Because the one thing he cannot abide is precisely that truth. So I say to you, the glorious doctrine of justification by faith is one of the most vital things that we could ever know and rest upon. And I pray God that this evening we may be resting precisely here on Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let us pray together. Our God and Father, we worship you for the gift of your Son, for the glories of your saving grace in Jesus Christ. And now this evening we ask that you will help us, that our hope and confidence our faith and trust may rest and remain in Jesus' blood and righteousness. And there alone, through all eternity, for his great name's sake, amen.